Okay. So one of the best investments you can make is having a clicker that you can just plug in whenever, because then you know whenever you have to do these things in class, you don't have to sit by this this screen right here. So uh, is, should I wait a little bit, or how's uh, is this a good time to start? Okay, cool. So uh, yeah, my name is Sean Bellamy McNulty. I'm in the NUS MBA program. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, life on the trading floor. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this talk stuff that you can't Google, right? So I'll talk a lot about my personal experiences. I'm not going to talk about you know technical indicators or any of these sorts of things. Just try to show you like what the day-to-day -day life was, how I ended up there, uh, and then kind of give you a better idea. I guess is everyone here an undergrad for the most part? Yeah. Yeah. So all BBAs, yeah. So uh, given and you guys have done your national service, but you, you guys, how many people have done internships here? Maybe by a show of hands. So and was it all in banking? Uh, I did maybe. Okay, what about, uh, anyone done a trading internship here? Oh, okay, so this is all gonna be fresh then. Okay, cool. <laughs> so this will be good, it'll give you an idea of trading something you're interested in. You're obviously already interested in markets. Uh, and so one thing I will say is, trading is different than any other part of the, the trading floor, right? Or any other part of the, sort of the market structure, right? So if you're in debt capital markets or investment banking and things, it's a totally different sort of uh, work atmosphere than, than trading. And I've done just about every type of trading. I was. Uh, I've rotated on equity trading desk, non delivery <coughs> forwards. In fact, I should go to the next slide for this. So this is like my professional background. Uh, so I, uh, I've done uh, non delivery forward rotation uh, or internship at Morgan Stanley in Hong Kong. I was also on their G10 Forex sales, so I saw both the trading and the sales side. Uh, when I was at CIBC, when you join up, you go through a uh, six month rotational program. So I was on the equity trading desk there. I was on the money markets desk. So I've seen basically every sort of trading role for the most part. So I have a general idea of what they are. And I will, and I have worked in some non trading roles, and it's, it is a totally different world. Uh, so I'll take you a little bit through that. Uh, my path is a little bit uh, different than I think most people's. Uh, I went back to do my undergrad at 24. So I grew up in a family business. It was a construction business. So I worked in construction most of my life. I then got involved in politics and ended up like running for mayor, which is like a long story. <laughs> uh, I, this is like a company in my family. It was, as a, it was actually a construction company, but one thing with finance is they don't really care about anything other than finance experience. So I don't put any of my construction experience. It almost takes away from you because you know, construction is looked at as kind of like a a lower level job, so I don't put it on my LinkedIn, but that's what I actually, kind of my background is in that. Then we were part owners there, so I was involved in running the golf center, chamber of commerce and things like that. When I was doing my undergrad, I got really involved in NIBC. Did you guys ever compete in NIBC? It might be something that, because uh, the undergrads, I did an exchange in NUS when I was doing my undergrad, and the undergrads here, you guys are by far the smartest undergrads I've ever studied with when I was doing my undergrad, so I think a, a competition like this is a really good one to look at. I competed in it this year on the NBA level, but the, one of the great things about it is they give you really good models. So if you're looking for like a really awesome DCF model with, uh, in fact, I have it if you want to email me and I can send it to you, but it's a really, really good model, and then you can use it in other competitions and even just play around with it. <laughs> so, uh, and, and sometimes models are a pain in the ass to build, you guys know, so it's nice to be able to, to get one as a side benefit to competing in the competition. And they put a ton of time into it, so. I know just from like when I was a director of it, it was just like a huge time commitment. I did also a, a stint in research, uh, an internship. That was my unpaid internship, because I think it's a really, like if you, you it's hard to get in the door, right? So I, I'm a huge proponent of it. If you can get an unpaid internship, like I'd do it without, a, without it was a huge, uh, it was a good, experience for me and then it also it made it much easier to then go from like the unpaid sort of as small asset management in Vancouver internship to then go to like Morgan Stanley Hong Kong it's like it, when I went to those interviews at least I had something to point to rather than talking about like running a driving range or something which they're not going to care about right uh, and then so <clears throat> did the NDF training I also wrote for Seeking Alpha so I, I got a bunch of articles up there that's another thing you could think about doing as a undergrad because you can write for them today if you want to just go apply and they pay you as well so you get paid some of the my better articles I make you know three four hundred US dollars from so they pay you one cent per is it one cent per click essentially is what it works out to so you know you get 50,000 views 500 bucks it's nice so, anyway, so that's kind of my background I'll be kind of coming to you from so we'll start off I'll skip all the other stuff we'll go right to the first internship that kind of really matters which was in Hong Kong uh, 
It was a really good introduction to the trading floor. Uh, and American banks, they're, they're much different. Like I think the, the national banks, they're, just, they're much more conservative culturally and everything like that. So that applies to the Singapore national banks like BBS, OCBC. It also applies to Canadian banks. There's just not the same risk appetite. Uh, uh, and so it was cool going to a place like Morgan Stanley and just seeing that like these guys, they want you to put on risk. It's a, it's a very high competitive market. Because they're American banks trying to compete globally, they don't have the same sort of national protection. So like, for instance, in Canadian banks, uh, even though it's like we have five big banks, they don't really compete with everyone. You know, with each other, it's kind of like this oligopoly where everyone gets their share of the market and it's kind of like this pretend competition. Uh, and that's obviously not the case here. So this was my desk set up. Uh, it's, pretty, it's kind of cool. I mean, I, I was an intern, so my desk, like the other guy, you see the guy behind me, he's got like another three screens above. <laughs> but like, the screen, you know, obviously the more important you are, the more screens you get, right? So, but it's still cool. Well, one of the, the best things about Morgan Stanley Hong Kong was the view. So it was, it, it doesn't show up quite as well here, and I wanted to kind of get more pictures in rather than less, but it's like their office is in the ICC. Uh, and so it's the fourth tallest tower in the world. It's on like the 40th floor. And you just look over Victoria Harbor, right? So it's like, no matter how bad your day's going, that's still like, that's a big pick me up. Uh, and that's actually one of the great things about working in finance is you get to work in nice buildings, right? So my brother-in-law, he works for the UN. Uh, and it, it's kind of funny. So I'm always you know, living in Hong Kong, Singapore, Toronto. Like that's kind of the places you go, like New York, London. That's where you'll, you'll end up if you're in, if you're in investment banking. Uh, if you're in the UN, you're in like Sudan, <coughs> Iraq, Afghanistan, so it's funny. So he's always, he was just living in Amman, Jordan with my sister, and it's kind of funny because I'll go and visit them, but they're always in like the really crappy areas, and in finance, you get to work in places like this. So nice, uh, nice bonus. That's my mom visiting when we were there. These are like the fellow interns, and so that, he's an Indian guy, but it's obviously it's dark. So, so it's, uh, <laughs> uh, and then you got Wu Yao from China, and he's actually Mexican, and he's Irish. So it was, it was actually not a single American there, funny enough. So it was kind of, you get a, a nice mix uh, at an international kind of uh, institution like that. Uh, there's the rest of the floor, and then obviously there's the building. So uh, a few takeaways uh, from, from that experience. I mean, the, intern, the internship, it's, it's fairly short, right? It's 10 weeks, so you don't get to do too much. Uh, in, like, you're not going to be managing risk or putting positions on. Uh, they spend a lot of money investing in your education, so that's another, even the, the other uh, internship I did at uh, the, the asset management firm, Global Securities in Vancouver, the great thing about those is they do, they, they do have people come in and talk to you, and they usually put a lot of effort into kind of showing you different things, so that was, uh, it's definitely worth doing, or it's, it's a very nice, or it really does uh, help you a lot when you start. There's some people I started with at CIBC who didn't do internships, and it really sets you back because you just don't know what you're getting into. Uh, another th kind of shocking thing with the uh, introduction is how harsh of a world the trading floor is. I was really taken aback. Like all those stories about you know people swearing at each other and being rude, those are absolutely true. I'll tell you a, a funny story about this guy. He actually he's a Singaporean. Uh, I used to work with him, and he wrote my uh, reference letter. To, for me to come to the NUSMBA, and he is an NDF trader at BNP in New York now, Wall Street. And uh, he was telling me about how easy I had it learning at CIBC, uh, because he, when he was learning, uh, there was another girl who was getting trained with him. And uh, I guess the boss, I think it was, it was at UBS in Singapore is where he started out, and the boss was really harsh on this girl, and she would start crying, and he'd say, listen, like, if you're going to be crying, don't look at me. I don't want to see you cry. So she would have to cry looking like away from the boss. And he would be sitting there. like, it. And so this is the kind of environment you have to be prepared for. And this is what I got myself into at Morgan Stanley. Like, right off the bat, uh, I was just extremely hostile. And it, I think it's kind of a test of character. They want to see, one, that you can, like, that you can take some abuse. Uh, and then, two, <clears throat> that you don't take it personally. So that's something you want to kind of ask yourself. An internship's a good way to test it out, but even if it's something you want to do, know that people are going to be rude to you, that it is a very hostile environment, and so if you want to be like a trader on the trading floor, you just prepare for the first couple of years. It's not the same kind of crap like you would take as an investment banker, where you know, you're know you like doing all this Excel modeling through all hours of the night, like, like the hours are a bit better and things. But on the flip side, I think you probably, I mean, I never did investment banking, but I just know that a lot of the things that 
people would say to you that I, I think if you do that in other roles in the bank, you'd probably get like HR letters and things. <laughs> but there is there's no HR letters in in trading. So moving on to the kind of the more relevant experience, this is where I was for two years at CIBC. Uh, here's some. So there's my desk set up there, and I'm going to take you through that in a little more detail just to give you an idea of uh, how everything is set up. There's the trading floor. That's kind of Bay Street in Toronto. Now this is in the, in the winter. So everyone's underground right now because it's so cold. So that's why there's no uh, people there. But this is kind of like Canada's, Canada's Wall Street. Uh, this guy's the head of FX sales, and this is all us kind of like sitting on the row here. Uh, uh, this is like my old place, which is it was great because it's nice. It's a nice place. Obviously, you do all right. This guy. Uh, these are some of my other uh, colleagues. Uh, this guy. He used to be at Morgan Stanley in London. He's still in London now. I'm not sure where he is, but he's. Uh, He's at like he's a broker I think now, but he was like a real badass trader, like huge positions and things. He was he'd really he'd really go for it. Uh, and then these are two other guys working with their finger in the camera. That's like kind of the uh, the uh, camaraderie thing. And that's Mikey Cope. He did some some that's that guy there, but he did some joke, and so I was putting him in a headlock. And so that kind of gives you an idea of like the flavor of what it's like uh, to work on the work on the floor. Uh, so it's like a lot of fun, obviously a lot of long hours. <coughs> Uh, and you do kind of, uh, as much as it is kind of hostile, at the end of the day, you're kind of like in the trenches together, right? So, like, you know, you all have your own P&Ls and everything, but you're, you know, you, you, you're, you're on your own team, but then you're also working together. And even though you're kind of tough with one another, you do offer kind of moral support from time to time as well. So, uh, I guess any questions about any sort of the, uh, the startup? I, I know that... Uh, uh, it's like uh, BBAs, you guys are, never have any questions. <laughs> so but if you do put up your hand, and I'm, I'm happy to answer some. Uh, if, you, if you want me to delve into any, any more specifics. So uh, life on the trading floor, or, uh, I figured I could take you through kind of the learning curve. So first thing you'll do when you, when you arrive on your desk is you'll want to set up your screen. So none of this, all you're set up with when you get to your desk, these two screens actually, this is the, the interbank markets here. Uh, and these are two separate computers. So it's actually three computers hooked up to five screens with my setup in Toronto. Uh, these two will be set up for you. Actually, you know what? That's not even true. Those, won't be, those will be set up, but you also have to pick the currencies you want to have displayed. So you need to, to really think, like, when you first get to the desk, you kind of personalize your whole setup, right? And there's this great saying that, like, failure to plan is planning to fail. All the guys that I knew who were really good traders, they would have very, they would think a lot and spend a lot of time kind of setting up how they wanted like their screens to be set up. And so uh, this is something you want to build yourself. It's helpful if beforehand, whatever you're doing now, how many people are trading on their own right now? Like, uh, so no one's trading on their own. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. Oh yeah, first, I think we met at the, uh, the um, that uh, recruiting event, right? So uh, yeah, so one, uh, if you uh, if you can if you're trading on your own now, you probably have a setup. That's very helpful because then essentially when you get to the desk, you, you kind of mimic it, except you have way better tools. So like like you know I have Bloomberg where instead of, I, I like these are the same things I'd watch on my own personal trading, but uh, it's just from the Bloomberg feeds and the Bloomberg sort of screens, it'd be uh, make it much easier. So there's this thing called Bloomberg Launchpad that you have everything up. So uh, <coughs> so yeah, that's that kind of your initial setup is very important. So I'll take you through. So this over here is what's called the EBS interbank market, right? So you have like Euro USD, dollar yen. It's kind of like the, the I guess you could kind of say the non-commonwealth countries. But uh, what, these is, what this essentially is, so all the banks, when they're dealing G10 FX, they're dealing through a broker. And so EBS is a broker, and it's just matching buyers and sellers. And so uh, this is kind of the most liquid G10 FX broker for these currencies. And then D2 is the other major one, which is owned by Reuters. And it's the same thing. It's just, it's just different currencies. And so will just be, like Euro will be more liquid here than here than on the D2. And so you, you have to go to different brokers depending on what you want to do. Uh, and obviously, the more liquid it is, the easier it is to get in and out of positions. Uh, then I, you also have, so all the banks like EBS, uh, you know, city, like every, basically every major bank, they have their own interbank uh, platforms. And so 
one of the things when you're when you're managing risk and making markets is you're kind of like you're 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 kind of shopping. So you're making a price, but you're also wanting to know what prices you have out there. And so I would have this is like an aggregator showing me all the where all the banks or bids and offers are on different things. And one of the funny things you'd be surprised how often that screws up, right? <laughs> and so. Uh, there are times when there are risk-free arbitrages, which I know in class they say don't exist, but at times on the floor, if you're quick, yeah, like I remember one time, uh, they, I think they didn't update the Aussie Kiwi rate, and we made like $50,000 just like paying the offer and hitting the bid on the other, just crossing the spread until they like obviously froze us <laughs> out of it. But it's funny when you, like, you see these little kinks in the market. Another interesting thing with these, so one of the big controversies in capital markets today is algorithms, right? And uh, you know, the fact that a lot of the trading and volume you see on the markets now is all just machines kind of buying and selling and like high frequency trading and all these things. So you can actually see this play out in real time on the floor. So what I could do, and this is kind of like another little trick that you kind of pick up, is so I could put an offer, which means like an offer to sell euros, uh, uh, like I could put an offer like for like 100 million euros on the EBS, right? now. EBS, one of the ways they make money is they sell what their orders are to these high frequency guys, right? So when I put that offer in, automatically, depending on what time of day it was, you'd see these prices start to move one way or the other. In that case, they'd move away, they would move away from your offer. So what they want you to do, if you're trying to sell euros, they, you're trying to get the highest price you can. And so the algos are trying to kind of move it away because they, they detect your order. So if I had to, let's say, buy euros, but I, but you know, I had time and it was an illiquid time of the day. What I might do, just to kind of screw these other banks too, is I'd put like the offer for 100 euros in there. It would move this down maybe half a pip or a pip. And then I'd start hitting their, or paying their offers on there. And then the only risk is, and this did happen to me a few times, is because you actually have a live offer in there, someone can then pay your offer. And next thing you know, instead of having to sell, like, you know, buy 100 euros, or you have to buy you know, 200 euros, right? So that, I remember one time I was doing that with dollar cad. And, uh, and uh, so I had all these offers loaded in. I think I had like 25 million at like over five different pips or whatever it was. So it was like 125 million in the offer. And it was like late in the afternoon, so it wasn't very liquid a time of day. And, uh, and then so I'm just, just like, each time the, the, the uh, prices are moving down on the bank aggregator, I'm, I'm just paying offers and just kind of buying out. And then all of a sudden Goldman comes in and just like swoops up all of my offers. <laughs> so the next thing I know, I, I end up having to, I, you know, I had to, and then like the other guy on the desk was like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, sorry, and then I had to kind of get out of it, and it's kind of funny. So anyway, so you're kind of playing these three things against each other, and there are these sort of weird kinks. So I guess the takeaway from that, and the reason why I'm telling you that, is that you know all the stuff you, you hear about in the textbooks and everything, it, it really is, it's important foundationally, but it, on the floor it is not, it's much more messy than that, right? Uh, then you have, so this right here is kind of like my positions, that's what, that's what I'd have up on the desk there, and this is again my personal setup, but so, you know, these are the screens I'm looking at the most, because I'm always looking at that to kind of see what's happening with the price action, because people ask me for prices all the time, so I'm always looking there. So the next important thing is I need to know what my risk is. So that's why I have this sort of setup here, so most of the time I'm looking at these screens and I always need to know where these prices are and what my position, positioning is. This is then the order book. So that's where you really make money on the trading floor. What makes, what gives you a big advantage on the trading floor. And that's where being in a big bank really helps. So uh, when you're trading, and this is all specific to FX, but when you're trading FX and you, and you have an order book, you can actually see where levels are in the market. And so it gives you an idea of how, to, how you can price things. So if someone has like, if, I, if like a sales guy's asked and said, hey, we have half a yard of euros to sell, right? which is a half a billion dollars, right? Uh, what they would do, uh, they might say to you, where do you think you could get out of those at, right? Now you could then look at your order book and see, okay, where are my euro bids, right? Like where are people looking to buy euros? And it gives you an idea of how much you'll move the market when you're selling you know, half a billion euros into it, right? Now I was at a kind of a tiny Canadian bank, so I didn't know anything really, right? So you had, we had such a small order book, it was almost useless other than in dollar cat. And so this is one of the things we complained about a lot because we were trading, uh, like, so I was a G10 trader X dollar CAD, and there's me and one other, other guy doing it, and you essentially had to make almost all your money on prop, which I'll, which I'll get to, but it was like, you know, you just, like, so a guy would say, hey, where do you think you can get out of, I don't know, 
how many euros. It's like, I don't know, right? Like, I don't even know where the orders are. I, I, like, I have a general idea, but, you know, if you're at a Deutsche Bank or a UBS, I mean, you've got, this order book has got, like, you know, like yards and yards, billions and billions of orders in it. And, you know, you're just, you have so much more market uh, or knowledge of the market and where price levels are, and then you can make a lot more money for the bank. And if you make more money for the bank, you make more money for yourself. <coughs> so, I had my positions down there. These are all Bloomberg uh, charts, so I you know, had a bunch of different things, a 10-year yield, uh, where stocks are. Depends on what's going on in the market as well. So, you know, right now, everyone's watching oil prices, right? So, oil would obviously be up there now. When oil was just like, you know, flatlined at $80, maybe you take it off and put something else on that's, you know, more relevant, right? I remember for a while, people were watching copper because of China, and, and maybe they still are, but it kind of rotates in and out. Then you have your chats, because you're always chatting to people to see what's going on, and talking to traders and things like that. Uh, and then over here is just emails and like Excel spreadsheets I'm working on and things, so it's not as exciting over there. Uh, then uh, it's not only the computer systems are important. Uh, these, so this here is a kind of an intercom system to brokers, so, so, you, can, so you can, so not to look forward, some of the, some of the less liquid markets, uh, you actually still talk to people. So you know like an open outcry pit? you see on uh, TV and things, it's still very much like that. So all day, this, this, there's a, this is what's called a hoot, but you can't really see it, but essentially it's just a speaker coming up. All day there's prices come, people saying, okay, someone's you know, selling $10 million Korea at this, right? And brokers are reading out prices and you're listening to it. So, you're, it, so you have to kind of pick up on where different things are. And then if you want to then, you know, buy or sell dollar Korea or wherever it is, or if you just need a price on something, you then press the intercom button down, say, hey, uh, I need a price on this, and then the brokers on the other end of the line, wherever they will be, will then start calling around and trying to, trying to find, find uh, bids and offers or prices for you for that. So, so it's not just about computers. Even today, it's still about you know talking to brokers, and that's an important part because those brokers, if they like you, They'll give you better prices, right? That's where the relationship comes in. If they don't like you, they, they will fuck you, right? <laughs> so, and it, it happens all the time. And they also, keep in mind, brokers are not taking risk. They're trying to get volume, right? So they're, you know, you have to be careful because their incentives are not the same as yours. They're not trying to make you money, right? They're trying to get you to trade. And so a lot of the times you have to really kind of, when you're talking to them, they'll be like, oh yeah, like, like you ask them for a price and they're like, so is it done? And like, they'll try to kind of push you into doing the deal with them. And then, and then right away they can, they can uh, you know, add it to their volume totals. And, and the way it works, even on, so when even you're dealing electronically old or voice, you're paying brokerage fees. So I think it's seven bucks a million is what the G10 brokerage fees is, are about. But on NDF so, and some of these less liquid things, the brokers actually make a lot of money. Like if you're a, you know, one of the top brokers for some of these non-deliverable forwards, you're making you know, millions of dollars a year like, like for yourself. So it can be very lucrative, but it's also a business that's dying as it goes more electronic. Then you even still have paper that matters. <clears throat> so this is a date book. So one of the things with currencies is you have the uh, settlement dates, and then if based on national holidays, those settlement dates will sometimes not match up <coughs> and other things. So you're actually still like, not, I mean, the older guys obviously use a lot more paper, but you still have paper in front of you as well. So essentially, you've, you've got a number of different systems you're operating uh, if you're a trader on the trading floor. Uh, any questions about the desk setup? All right, cool. So, lingo. This, <clears throat> to me, was by far the toughest part of picking up. And keep, like, I should clarify this as well. So I, I traded FX Prof and I did the research uh, internship. And I traded FX Prof for like three years in uni while well, I was doing my undergrad. Uh, because I mean, the whole reason I went to do my undergrad was so I could get into FX, like so I could get on a trading floor. So it was, it was, it was very sort of targeted for me. Uh, I, I was horrible at this, like horrible. Like my boss hated me for like the first two months, and like so I knew about prop trading, but being on a uh, floor making markets and things is a totally different thing. And it, one of the hardest things is not only the lingo, but you have to learn to hear everything. And it, it sounds weird, but. It, you actually kind of develop the skill, and it takes you know six, seven, eight months. But you just start to pick up like you, like the brokers talking, and like it all starts to kind of register for you. But it doesn't happen automatically, and it's very unnatural because it's almost impolite, right? You don't like if you're listening in on other people's conversations. It's it's not a 
it's something that people generally don't appreciate, right? And you're kind of like socially conditioned to, to not listen to people. And so that is the exact opposite. And the guys who have been on the floor for a long time, it's amazing the stuff. They'll hear everything that's going on. Like you'll just be talking to a guy next to them and they'll know that entire conversation that like what you guys are talking about. And you know, it'll look like he's just on his computer screwing around. So that was one of the, t like learning curve wise, that was so difficult. Because the problem is too, is like a lot of times you'll have two sales guys talking to you at once. One will be like, what's your offer, 10 euros? With a, like, I give you $10 Swiss, right? And it's like, okay. And then it's like, okay, what's your price now? What's your price? And this now is easy because it's both 10, but let's say it's like 25, one and 17 of the other. And you're trying to like, you know, make the market and get out of the risk and tell the, the guy who it is. And at the same time, you have to know who the client is, what sales guy is coming from. So it's like, you're, you've got all this stuff going on. And then this lingo, it's totally different. So it's like, what's your price on 100 euro US, like 100 euros, right? And so that's, that's fairly straightforward because then you're showing a bid and an offer, right? If a guy says to you $100 saying mine, right? Then it's, he's buying from you, right? So that's, I guess, a little bit easier. But then if, I say, if he says, I'm paying you for dollar saying, that's the exact same thing. So he's buying dollar sing off of. So you have these kind of double meanings, and different guys will say it different ways. Uh, another problem is, is, and this comes back to kind of what bank you're at, some salespeople aren't trained very well, and so they don't say things properly, right? And so they'll say, dollar sing, uh, I want to buy some from you, and the client is this, and you're like, Jesus, like, okay, you know, like, because you, you're trying to kind of decipher it all. And then another guy will come and be like, 100 euros is yours. And then you're like, okay, so he's selling 100 euros. And like, you know, you just have to, which means I'm buying it. And it's, it's, it's picking all that up. It helps a lot if your salespeople are trained. Uh, a lot of times they're not. Uh, another thing that gets quite challenging on the trading floor is these crosses and things. So uh, you, you get these sort of weird crosses. And then, and then so it's not just... Me not just knowing the kind of bigger currencies. And I guess this would transfer over to fixed income, but I, I don't know exactly how, because I didn't spend a lot of time there, but even on equities and things, where you get like a weird name they ask you for. Uh, and it, uh, it, it, so it, then, you, then you have to kind of start thinking, okay, what's the Kiwi and US dollar rate? What's the dollar Swiss rate? And then you gotta calculate your crosses. And you gotta do that all within you know, like 10 seconds sort of thing, right? And that's where your setup is very important as well, right? Because you wanna be kind of set up in a way that maybe it's not on your first screens, but you can alt tab and you have another thing with all these sort of weird quotes on it, which you can then, then price. Uh, so anyway, so then, yeah, and then you have other sort of orders, which are kind of like, oh, I want to work $100 yen at the 120 the fig, right? So what that means is the client wants to buy $100 yen, no, no worse than 120 the figure, right? 120.00. The issue with orders like this is when they say no worse, right? Let's say dollar yen goes through the figure and it goes down to like 119.80 or something like that, right? Then they expect you, they don't want, if you say, hey, you're filled at 120, they'll be like, well, why, right? Like, why did you buy it all? Like I said, work it, like, you know, like try to do a bit better, right? And that's where, that's where, that's where like being a trader is such a pain because, because they, uh, it's kind of like you're always, you can always kind of do better in everyone's, and then the other thing is too, let's say it goes down to like 119.95, and you're like, okay, maybe it's gonna get, maybe I can buy this a bit better and kind of make the client happy, and then it pops back up to like 120.50, right? And he's like, oh, did you, am I filled? And you're like, well, not really, right? And then he's like, well, why aren't I? I was like, well, I was trying to get you a better price. And he's like, well, I said, work it at the figure. Why didn't you work it at the figure? And so it's like, that's the kind of conversations you have every single day. So one thing, with the, the lingo's tricky, and then also everyone's trying to kind of lose, use the lingo to kind of screw you, right? So you're always playing defense. And the, no matter what you do, someone's gonna complain, like, hey, you could have done a better job on that fill, right? And you're like, okay, well, whatever. Uh, so be prepared for that if you wanna be on a trading floor. Everyone's gonna complain about everything you do, no matter what you do. <laughs> so types of clients, this kind of gets back to uh, uh, the what I was talking about in terms of uh, in terms of who's reading you out the order. So the retail salespeople, the people do with like the retail, retail buyers and sellers, the, the, the clients are, aren't going to be sophisticated, so the salespeople usually won't be sophisticated. And so as a trader, so these guys will all be talking to different clients. Uh, as a trader, they'll all be talking to you, right, for your product. So you need to know like who's doing what and then be prepared for very different types of orders, right? So the retail guys, 
Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the salespeople aren't sophisticated, the clients aren't sophisticated, the margins are great. These are like softballs, right? Like these ones you're gonna make money on all the time. It's just like the only annoying thing is they're gonna say everything wrong. And like the biggest thing you have to watch for this, and this happened to me, is usually the corp, the salespeople will screw up how they they ask you for a price because most of the time they deal through the electronic platforms because it's smaller amounts. So the odd time they do have to deal with you, your biggest <coughs> concern here is mistake prevention. Because if they say, hey, I want to like buy this or sell this, like some of them, like this one guy, fucking this old guy, I used to, uh, he was a nice guy and everything, but he had this like weird idea. So the way a salesperson is supposed to talk to you is from the client's perspective, right? Like the, what's the client doing? The client's buying euros, so he's like, I want to buy euros because he's representing the client, right? But some guys, for some reason, think, that, think of themselves as like representing the bank, right? So then when they say, I want to buy 100 euros, it's like, no, the bank wants to buy 100 euros and the client wants to sell 100 euros. And that's the kind of crap you'll get from these retail guys. And so you just like, when you, when they, you almost have to treat them like children, right? And this is what the guy who trained me told you, that, you know, imagine them like children, right? Like when he's like, oh, I want to like, you know, buy, and it'll never be 100 euros, it'll be like five euros or something. He's like, oh, I want to buy. Five euros. Like now, it's like, do you want to buy five euros, or does your client want to buy five euros? Is the bank like, what does that mean to you, right? <laughs> and then you have to kind of baby them through it. And then the funny thing is, is that if they ask, you, like, the, the reason why you have to kind of baby them through it is if you say as the trader, like, oh, he didn't read the order right. It's like, well, it's your job to to figure out what he's saying. Like, it, it, as a trader, the responsibility rests with you. So there is no room for like, oh, well, he didn't say it right. Your boss isn't going to care about that, right? No one's going to care about that. And the sales guy, is, he's not going to bail you out. He's going to be like, no, no, I didn't say it that way. Or like, you should have known. So it's, you have to keep in mind that the buck stops with you. If you want to be a trader, you have to keep in mind that one, everyone's going to complain about you. And two, there are no excuses, right? Like they just, they're not interested in it. And the salespeople seem to always, you know, that's what they do. Salespeople are good at kind of getting along with everyone. They always get out of it and it always ends up on your p &L, right? So. Uh, that's, that's a real pain. Now the corporate guys are a little more sophisticated uh, and the nice thing with them, this is kind of your bread and butter of be like the DBS bread and butter, the CIBC uh, bread and butter because these companies like they make money from from operating, right? They don't make money from uh, from you know their FX hedging or whatever like that. So and they usually have like bank accounts with the banks and they have like kind of these developed relationships. So these guys are awesome because you can make lots of money on these guys, right? Their orders are a little bit better. They aren't as frequent. And these corporate guys generally, they're not as good as the institutional salespeople, but they'll get the orders right more often. And so this, these guys are, these are, these guys are great. They're kind of just like a level up from retail and like good money makers and everything. And this is what's basically known as, uh, there's, there's two types of uh, money you make on the trading floor. There's prop trading, which is the, where you, you know, you're making money on your own positions and risk management. And then there's what they call, uh, the, uh, the right term is, it's escaped right now, it's the, uh, it's like the money the desk is made, but there's a better word for it. Just give me a second. Uh, oh, franchise business. So it's called the franchise business. So the franchise business is the theoretical money that seat would make, like the seat you're sitting in as the G10 trader, as the dollar cad trader, if anyone was sitting there, right? And that Franchise business is a function of basically these corporate and retail guys where the you know they're, you're very good, showing them very wide bid ask <coughs> spreads and it's very easy to get in and out of positions right so those any like if you make money on these guys like who cares right like everyone can do that and sure you can kind of profit maximize but 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 uh, but that's not going to get you paid at the end of the day if you're on the trading floor institutional guys. This is the key point with the institutional guys. They are smarter than you. There's just like, there's th these are like ex-traders, they're hedge fund guys, things like that. They're the ones who were good enough to kind of move out of the bank into, into the buy side, and you've really got to watch them. So like, there were tons of clients that we had that we would lose money on like this, and some of them we just fired, right? So we'd have like hedge funds in New York call us up, and they they would just they would they would just often they try to pick you off. They'd ask you for a price in like some illiquid NDF, and then try to like pick you off, and then would be paying a bunch of people on the street. So, so you'd get a small portion of the business, and as soon as you sort of made the made the market for them, you would be out of the money right away. Uh, so these these guys, the nice thing with these these sales guys are very sophisticated. It's like these are the guys that are doing a lot of volume with you. Uh, so you know you get a really good relationship with them. In the pictures, that's like uh, that's Darcy there. Like this guy, you know, he's asking me for 
you know, crisis all, all the time, right? So you, these guys you kind of get to know fairly well. So that's, uh, uh, so that's nice in terms of functionality. The, the downside with this is there's, in G10FX especially, there's like zero margin in that business, right? Like, you're, like you've really got to be very smart to make money on the, in the institutional guys. And there's like a few different ways to do it, but it's really, these guys, if you can make a little bit of money and kind of get out of the position, that's like a win, right? You, you're, you're not, it's very hard to hit home runs with these guys. And they're, they're just, they're smarter than you. They know what the price should be at. They know where the market <coughs> is. They're talking to every bank on the street. So it's, it's, uh, it's, these guys you have to really watch out for. And you have to really make sure that, uh, you know, if, like you also just really want to kind of double check and, you know, if, if someone's asking you for a price and something. And, and knowing your client here is extremely important. So I'll give you an example. Uh, PIMCO was one of our clients at CIBC. And they, I lost so much money dealing with PIMCO, it was like unbelievable. And the reason why is because PIMCO, when they're buying something, you know, it's like the largest bond fund in the world, right? When they're buying or selling something, they're moving the market so much and they're dealing with a ton of different banks. And so what, what PIMCO would do, and I have no idea why we still have them as a client, but PIMCO does is they got like their traders at PIMCO, right? They call up all their different salespeople at all different banks and say like, what's your price in like 200 million euros or something like that, right? And, uh, and everyone's, because maybe they got to buy a yard or two yards or something, right? So every bank sees it. It's like, okay, it's a price for 200 million euros, right? So you think that all that the market's going to be kind of dealing with or all that's going to be going to the market is, like, you know, besides the regular flow, is going to be like a $200 million trade, which is decent size but not massive, right? But a $2, two billion trade, is a lot of, that's a lot of euros, right, to move in and out of the move in and out of the euro position, right? So what they'll do, the Pimco guys will do, is they'll call up the like all their different salespeople at all the different banks and say, you know, what's your price in two hundred million euros? And uh, and then they'd say, oh, you know, everyone gives their price, right? Including myself, I say, okay, you know, it's like, you know, thirty thirty five or something like that, like one hundred eight thirty one hundred eight thirty five. And then they'd say, okay, like mine, right? But they do it all at the same time. So then me and all the other traders, let's say it's like 32, 33, and you got like two or three pips of margin built in, we all start buying, or like, so if they're buying euros, we all start selling euros. So they, they hit our bid at 30, it's 32, 33, and so I start selling euros at 32, and then you know you, you clear out those bids, but because we're all doing it, all of a sudden you look at the screen and euros trading like 108, 20 or something like that, right? Because everyone's been selling like at all these different banks. And so you can imagine that you know now you're long 200 euros, you're down 10 pips in it, right? So you're down, you know, $20,000 or no, 200,000 right there, right? And so like, you, you can see how that can go against you very, very quickly, right? So yeah, you really gotta watch these institutional guys. And so the guy who trained me about these clients and all these things, this guy named John Prober, 25 years, he's retired now, but you know, he, this is, these are all kind of his errors, right? And like the big thing with him was error prevention, right? Because you know, it's very difficult, you can't, you know, you can't control your flow and all these things, but you can, control the amount of errors you make. So you know, keep in mind, if you want to be a trader and, and you want to be on that side of the business, you've really got to be about, if you've, you've really got to prevent errors. That's a very important, very important part of it. So one of the most important things is performance. This is, this is, uh, for this is my first six months. I didn't get my last performance uh, review because I was, I was obviously gone. Like I, I left, right? <laughs> so, but uh, before we did their year end, so. If you're, if you're on the trading floor, if you're a trader, one of the things you do, uh, or every year you have this meeting on your performance, and then from that meeting, they give you a printout with all your stats, and then they tell you what your bonus is, right? And so it's like bonus day, and so it can be a good or a bad day depending on how your year was. So uh, this, is, this is my stats uh, for, my, it was just my first six months, so you can see how like my kind of daily p &L, you can see some really shitty days and some good days, right? But like that was not a good day. <laughs> that wasn't either, right? And so it's kind of, uh, uh, and then you can see even my distribution. So I actually had more, these are uh, p &L days. So I had more losing days than winning days, but that's a pretty normal distribution in terms of 50-50. And one of the differences with, this is one of the other things I found difficult, is so like when I was doing my own sort of prop trading stuff, I could do, I could trade when I wanted to trade and not trade when I wanted to trade. The, the tough thing on the trading floor is even if you don't really have a feel for the market, you have, like you have, you're on the floor, you're making markets, you're taking risks, you have to kind of be there. And so my actual, my personal trading record is much better than this, like when I can just kind of trade when I want to or see a position. 
Uh, I find most of the guys, it's usually, I mean, some of the better traders, like, so one guy, the guy who trained me, Proberts, he'd have like a bunch of bars here. He wouldn't have very many of these because he just didn't make big mistakes. But he wouldn't have too many of these either. He was just like a very sort of tight distribution with a lot of kind of little, like just make a little bit every day. That was kind of his thing. So everyone has different sort of styles. This distribution, the reason why I included it in wasn't to say if I was a good trader or not, but the important thing is to understand what your life is like, right? The reason why being a trader is difficult is because you can see that it's just not a linear sort of thing where like if you're a sales guy, you're kind of making more sales, or if you're working in any sort of other corporate environment, you're kind of got this linear growth where you have some good days, some bad days, but it doesn't really matter. Here it's like, you're gonna have, half of them are gonna be good days, half of them are gonna be really shitty days, some of the days are gonna be really shitty, some of the days are gonna be really good. So you have these emotional highs and lows. Some people are better at dealing with those than others, right? So this is another thing where if you're thinking about who you are as a person, keep like, be, ensure you're able to deal with that sort of, that sort of workplace environment, right? Where you're just gonna, like you know throughout the year, you either like, there's a, a number of different ways of dealing with it, but you have to be prepared to know that at some point in the year you're gonna have huge down days, some days you're gonna have huge up days. The tough thing with days like today, like I guarantee you this is the day that Pimco ran me over. Like it wasn't even really my fault, right? It's just like, what am I gonna do? Like the, like, you know, the, guy, the client came in, before I even had a chance to get out of the position, I was already screwed, right? So at that point, you're just trying to like not totally screw, like you're trying to just kind of loss minimization, right? So yeah, very important. It's not a linear thing. It's not like, you know, you'll have a budget to make whatever you're gonna make for the bank. Like usually the trade will be like anywhere between like 1 million and 10 million bucks they'll want you to make for the bank, depending on where your seat is or whatever. Uh, it's not gonna be like, you know, you take 10 million bucks, you're gonna make a million bucks a month and around that, and that's gonna be it. It's gonna be like, you're gonna lose a bunch of money, then make a bunch of money, and you're just gonna be all over the place. And so there's, it's a real emotional roller coaster. <clears throat> Personal performance. Yeah, this is more, this is like, you can see that uh, it's much more, I guess, a little more steady. This is me, like, this is 2014. So this is me taking money out and then putting money back into my account. But you see, it's just like, you know, I, I could kind of trade when I wanted to trade. Uh, these are my days. So the greens, days I made money, and then purples when I lost. So you can see, like, uh, Wednesday's a good day, <laughs> Sunday's all right, Tuesday not so much. But I, I mean, I guess my, my point is one, kind of tying to the other thing is that prop trading is a lot different than market mating. Two is that just whatever you do, whether it's trading or anything else, keep stats. If you can't measure it, as this great saying Michael Bloomberg said, you can't manage it. So, uh, you know, just by looking at this, I have an idea like, you know, where, where there are areas for improvements, days I should stay away from the market. Even this, this is like the amount of time I held the position to the amount of money I made. So this is like a really stupid trade, right? I don't know what I was doing there, but it was colossally stupid, right? Because I just held something until it didn't make any money. This was okay. These are these ones I don't mind, but essentially you want to have like a bunch of red dots here and a bunch of green dots all over here, right? Uh, and then you also need to know where you make money and where you don't make money. So this is like all my prop trading over all the things. So you can see like long, shorts, and so I know like Aussie CAD, I'm all right in. I see one that I really suck at, CAD yen. It's actually kind of interesting, dollar CAD I'm not too bad at because I obviously, I guess being from Canada, I don't know, so I've right 40, had 40 correct trades, 18 incorrect trades there. But yeah, some of them, like I think it was like the Danish, uh, where is it? Yeah, this is the, oh, that's not too bad, 3-3. Three, three. But anyway, you can kind of get an idea where you can kind of like, you, you start keeping track of stats like this, and you want to do it on the trading floor as well. And then you just, you know, you for whatever reason, whether it's luck or, you know, sometimes you have to be good to be lucky, uh, just, you know, st stick to the stuff you you trade better at. If you find there's a certain instrument that every time you trade it, you lose money, stop doing it, right? And if you find something that you do make money on pretty consistently, like you know, the sterling odds, right? I've had one, like I've never made any money on that, so I don't know, probably shouldn't trade it, but I guess I might want to trade it, but still, it's like you kind of look for these sort of outliers and then you know, kind of fine tune your process. And then finally, one of the great things about trading is um, that they obviously pay you pretty well, and so you get to do a lot of other fun stuff. So sailing, uh, CFL, <coughs> NBA, NFL in Buffalo, Jay-Z concert, birthday celebrations, Major League, uh, this tennis, Roger Cup, Serena Williams there. So, uh, I mean, it's always important, you know, you don't want to be one of these people who's just super focused on work. And I think, frankly, I think Singaporeans, you guys are like almost more about that than other people. Like you get super focused in on these things. And like most of the Singaporeans in our MBA program are doing part-time MBAs, so they keep their job throughout it. And to me, that's just like no fun at all, because you know, I, 
a, a full-time MBA is much more relaxed and you get to hang out, so it's uh, much nicer. So uh, that's kind of the gist of it. I, didn't, I, I kind of want to just give you guys a feel of what life was like on the trading floor uh, within the one hour, so we're at 45 minutes, so that's about perfect. And I, actually, I'm in class right now, so, so, so I, uh, I'll uh, pop back after, uh, after we're wrapped up here. But yeah, that gives you an idea what trading's like on the trading floor. I think the most important thing is knowing about who you are uh, what, you know, like, do you, can you deal with that sort of P&L volatility? Uh, do you like to work independently? Can you deal with people being rude to you all the time? Uh, do you like fast paced sort of environment? Uh, and then if, if it's a yes to most of those things, uh, then I think trading floor is probably uh, made for you. And I guess the last thing I would add is that it's an awesome job. So if it, it's something that's very, you know, you obviously have to work very hard at it, it's not easy to get into, but I will say, like, I really love it. Uh, I just signed on, I'll be at JP Morgan on their FX options desk once I wrap up <coughs> school here. So, uh, I mean, I'm going back into the industry. It's gonna, like, it's just, it's super fun. It's very fast paced. Uh, the guys you meet are interesting and smart. You can imagine because of the volatility, it has a lot of interesting characters in it. So that makes it a lot of fun. Like the guys, you're not working with boring people. They're very interesting people. And so, like I said, if it's something you're into, uh, I'd say definitely pursue it, and I think you'll be very happy that you did so. Cool. And that's it. So uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, may I ask some questions?